Hi, this is Marina from Dance Star Astrology bringing you the full moon in September the 14th, which is at 21 Pisces. Now, this full moon is going to be conjunct Neptune opposite Mars and square Jupiter. And you'll see that it is part of this T-square, very interesting T-square that's coming. And it's on um, Markab, which is in Pegasus, the winged horse, the flying horse. And the crystal that I've chosen for this will be the tiger's eye. And the tarot card is the Ten of Cups, which is a very lucky and fortunate um, card. But that's if you manage to keep your feet on the ground and not get spellbound by all the temptations that are happening with this full moon because it's as you can see there's so much going on with it I mean just look at the chart I and mean, the main thing that is a bit concerning is the well there's Mars god there's so many things the, the main thing is the t-square which is Mars square Jupiter which is also um, Mars opposite Neptune as well and we'll get into the aspects of that but also Lilith is involved and now, I'm going to talk about Lilith later because this is one time when she actually does have an effect because this is, we are, are basically coming out of a supermoon season and that the last moon actually, which I didn't kind of know about and I didn't cover and I should have done really, um, was, was a supermoon. And the whole point of a supermoon is that it's when the moon is at its perigee and the perigee is when the moon is closest to the earth and it's bigger in the sky. Um, when, the, when the perigee coincides with an actual full moon, that's when you can really see it in all its glory. Now, the apogee is when the moon is furthest away from the earth. And the day before this full moon, it actually will be furthest away. So it's going to be a black moon Lilith um, at this full moon. Um, although, I mean, that's a contradiction in terms because it's a full moon, which is nice and bright in the sky, but it will actually be furthest away. Unfortunately, with the, the last super moon, it was a new moon, so you couldn't really see it. So it's only when you get the perigee with also a full moon at the same time is when you'll see it look particularly big in the sky. I don't know if it actually does look that much bigger. It depends. Um, but anyway, the point is, now I know that... Lilith, the the whole point of true Lilith is that it does measure and show these points, but only, only if you use true Lilith. So I will talk about Lilith later on because since we're in sort of apogee, por, 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 porridge, porridge season, perigee and apogee season, um, because it, it's, it's sort of only coincide it coincides a bit sort of twice a year a bit like the eclipses you know the eclipses happen when the nodes are close to the to the moon so it's, it's a similar case that it sort of coincides sort of twice a year kind of so so I thought this is a very opportune moment then really to talk about Lilith but first of all let's get on with the moon so yeah, I call this one fight or flight because of the Pegasus influence as well. And also just because the moon in Pisces Decan 3 is all about mood changes um, because really when you're coming to the end of Pisces, you're also on the way to Aries, which is the start of a new season. But obviously um, we're talking about the new, sorry, the full moon here. So we're not in Pisces season going into Aries. We're just sort of symbolically doing that. So the full moon in Pisces Decan 3, um, it's very hard to keep hold of relationships at this time because it's quite hard to stick to any project and the fluctuating emotions are going all over the place. We're apt to lash out for no apparent reason. So this Decan is typical of the temperament that is often described as being artistic. Yet, in my research, I actually found there were very few artists that did have their moon in this decan, but there were certainly people who had their finger on the pulse of what's popular in the collective. So this decan, and at this time, we're very sensitive to what 
our peers or the public perceive us to be. And if we can't be loved, then we might go out of our way to be unpopular and delight in being controversial. So the moon here loves to be the subject of gossip and seems to lap up any attention, even if it's negative. So bad press doesn't exist as long as this person's being talked about. So at this time, we may see many prominent people feeding off drama in the collective and the moon here can actually be quite bratty also. So infantile rages can emerge due to unresolved childhood trauma. So now, as you can see with the actual chart, I mean, I think the drama situation could get ramped up really high because, I mean, the moon opposite Neptune, yes, definitely. Um, even though Mars in Virgo isn't that dramatic, it's just that there's so much other stuff going on and Jupiter in Sagittarius, I mean, there it's in its most kind of Jupiter and bombastic um, mode really. And then with uh, Neptune in Pisces as well, being extra Pisces and extra watery, it just, it's very slushy. It's very smaltzy. That's a very smaltzy T, T square, I think there. So I think this is going to be a moon where, wow, you're really going to be, I mean, the, the violin strings are going to come out basically. So whatever is in the news, they're just going to really try and milk your emotions and get you to make emotional decisions that aren't based on any kind of logic at all. Now, another thing that comes up with Pegasus is accidents because of the myth involved with it. Um, basically, his rider um, fell off because he got freaked out that he was almost reaching for the stars and then he just fell off. So it's kind of like someone who aims really high and then just as he's almost there and then he gets the prize, can kind of sabotage themselves. So it's kind of self-sabotage as well. Uh, and not believing you deserve it. So, um, so yeah, the, the meaning of the moon on Markab, according to Robson, is injuries from enemies and domestic matters. Fairly good health, but many accidents. So maybe it's like the cat with nine lives there. Um, then Bernadette Brady says to be emotionally consistent, to be unchanging in one's devotion, to see, to serve in a practical manner, the needs of others. So that's kind of weird because she sort of says it's emotionally consistent, but um, I would say it's not that. So I'm not sure about her interpretation there. Um, I suppose she says it's in, in terms of being devoted to someone. So maybe it's more to do with being completely devoted and love struck. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's in that way. Um, but emotionally, I think swayed happens very much with with Pisces Decan 3. Now, Manolis says about this um, constellation of Pegasus that it will bring forth people endowed with a swiftness of movement and limbs alert to perform any every task. Proudly mounted on its back, he will wage war from on high, horseman and soldier in one. Another will possess the ability to rob the race course of its true length. Such is his speed. I love the way he writes, Manolis and to make the ground vanish before him. He will know the herbs which bring aid to an animal's limbs and those which grow for the use of man. Yay, so it's, yeah, it's the healer as well then, isn't it as well? And um, generally a swiftness. And I think, I mean, it makes me think of yoga actually as well. So um, being very agile, I suppose yoga isn't exactly the swiftest thing. So probably not, <laughs> unless it's like Ashtanga yoga. Yeah. So the tarot card, this is the Cinderella effect as well. And I think maybe we have a bit of the Cinderella effect going on with Neptune involved in this T-square. So Teach Me Tarot say that this card suggests emotional fulfillment, settling down and starting a family. You found the love you've searched for. You may have a picture painted in your head of the perfect ideal partner and life for you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this as we all have our own idea of what we're looking for and a dream that we would really dearly love to come true. So painting a picture is appropriate as such, as this is such an imaginative decan. So karmically for artists, the Ten of Cups suggests 
exceptional work. Your creations will be truly inspiring and may even be your best yet. So like high flying Pegasus, it's all taking off you now and you may even get some global recognition. So, I mean, this is really if you have anything that connects with the this full moon. So it can be either Pisces, 21 Pisces or 21 of Virgo opposite. But I have to say it's probably all the mutables that are around those degrees because it's Jupiter. Jupiter's, even if it's a square, a square from Jupiter is not such a bad thing. Just just be careful about overreaching yourself because, yeah, that's the kind of thing with Pegasus as well. It's like aiming too high and then getting a bit kind of carried away with it and uh, losing your footing because you're so excited. So you just have to try and keep calm if you do anything adventurous. And, yeah, don't drive your winged horse under the influence of alcohol because, uh, yeah, Neptune is close by as well. And probably accidents, drunken driving accidents could be quite a thing at this full moon. So that's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of good things about this full moon with the card and everything and the imagination. Um, but it's you just have to be careful of doing something stupid and uh, yeah, getting drunk and being under the influence of mind altering drugs. So let's read the Picatrix because I, I just love the way old people, the old people, the olden people, the olden day people used to speak. So um, it is a sad man full of evil thoughts, thinking of deception and treachery. And before him is a woman with a donkey climbing atop of her. Oh my God. That sounds very dodgy indeed. Anyway, uh, carry on. And in her hand is a bird. This is the face of advancement and lying with women with a great appetite and of quiet and seeking rest. <laughs> what? Anyway, you'll see the picture's quite bonkers as well. I mean, I don't know what that donkey thing is about. I mean, anyway. Okay, well, that's, um, well, we've got flying horses and now we've got donkey, donkey, <laughs> donkey love. Anyway. All right. Um, so the T-square, let's look at that. Well, the Mars square Jupiter is pretty racy, shall we say. Um, it's pretty much a really good combination for a military commander. It's daring, courageous, pioneering, bustling with red hot sexual energy, but not with donkeys, please. Um, <laughs> um, very physical and very hard to keep still with that one as well. Um, can be quite greedy. So... So, yeah, I mean, it's a very much a go-getting square. Um, but it, I called it um, Bawdy Conquistadors as well, because it's quite bawdy. It's quite boisterous as well. Um, so, but with with Neptune, Jupiter square Neptune, this, this has been the big aspect of the year, actually. And this is the last hit of it. Or there will be one more hit in September the 21st exactly but um it's been at play really in the last last couple of months i've noticed it's sort of been been about in the background the whole sort of um victim savior kind of narrative as well now but this one i i came to the conclusion that it really is about testing whether your dreams are unrealistic or if you practice what you preach it's the aspects of false messiahs and wasting money on lost causes and fairy tales during this time you'll be asked to be generous and will believe the best in people however you might be shown that letting someone enjoy a parasitical relationship with you actually harms them as much as you in the long term being someone's lifelong crutch means that the person who is leaning on you fails to develop spiritual muscles and backbone in our personal lives, this is the aspect of creating a rod for your own back if you take it too far. So I've written a whole big post on Jupiter square Neptune and um, you can have a look at that one. Um, I just see it as quite a, ne a very sort of Chiron-y type of vibration really because it is related to, Neptune's related to healing and then Jupiter likes to play the saviour as well. But I think with Mars in the, in the mix, it can work like... Um, I mean, this is this is my theory that the square can be turned into a diamond as the native helps others break free of their need to play the master in relationships. This person eventually makes a great healer 
or this aspect can make a great healer rather, but only after some harsh lessons have been learned. So I think with Mars opposite Neptune and then squaring Jupiter, that is going to be the hard lessons during this moon as well. So I chose the tiger's eye as the healing crystal because I just thought it was it's just pretty. <laughs> it's just pretty and it goes with all the pictures and um, it seemed to to call to me anyway. So it's a remarkable ally for the mind, balancing emotional extremes and allowing scattered thoughts, feelings and information to come together in a way that makes sense. It brings focus and stability, enabling one to make decisions from a place of reason rather than emotion. I mean, this is actually why this goes very well with this moon. Um, it's funny, I always choose, I kind of choose the crystals intuitively and then when I read them I go, oh my god, this is just what we need. So um, this, yeah, it's worked out uh, quite well. It's ideal for those who are spaced out and uncommitted to find purpose. For those who find it difficult to remain optimistic, it stimulates hope and confidence for the future. So yeah, I mean, I think with the, the spaced out thing, as well it just it just seems to be a good one to ground also and with neptune neptune can make you feel quite foggy in in the brain anyway and um oh, another thing what i liked about tiger's eye is because it can actually be used to ward off the evil eye because it's you know tiger's eye cat's eye and reflect back any malice or threats without absorbing any negative energy holding a tiger's eye was also used to discern if someone else was reliable or not. Traditionally, it was believed by the end of the day, any deception would be revealed. Again, you know, we need this when Neptune's around at play and also if Lilith is around and at play um, because this is a, a, it's a full moon, but it's being influenced by the dark because this is an apogee moon. It's not exactly an apogee moon. It would have to be exact, but it's pretty close. And I just think, you know, with the Neptune energy and those squares, it's it's ripe for deception and sorcery. So, you know, there's there's a, it just has to be channeled. The energy has to be channeled wisely and uh, we have to keep our feet on the ground. And if we are gonna jump on Pegasus, I think, you see, Pegasus actually knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. The actual horse did. Um, so sometimes we just have to kind of go with the flow with this one. And we can't really, maybe it is going with intuition and just making sure that we have a very fine tuned intuition because the problem is a lot of us don't really know the difference between intuition and mind control. And, and that's the problem because we don't know whether we just don't know we just don't know and the only way we can know really is just to keep our keep ourselves as pure as we possibly can and we're going to make mistakes you know we're not we're not to err is to be human as it were so anyway talking about mistakes yes okay i'm going to talk about lilith again because um, since I kind of came out and said that I do think Lilith isn't a good thing, um, I've had some backlash, not much actually, to be honest, but there was one big long message on Facebook. I'm just, I just haven't read it properly, but I skimmed through it and I just thought, oh God, this is all the things I used to think. Um, so you see, I can't blame people for thinking that because I don't know how old these commenters are, uh, sometimes, especially if they're, you know, they're anonymous. Um, because I used to think like that when I was 18. Um, and actually, when I'm saying 18, I mean, not till, till quite recently, you know, up until the age of 42. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a recent development for me, but I think everyone is waking up a lot quicker now. So there are younger people that are really, you know, <laughs> way more on the ball than I ever was at that age. So I just think it's people are either, it just seems to me that people are either really way in la la unicorn land or they're just, you know, they're very, very 
advanced and these are the true kind of uh well truth truthers really and and there are young ones as well very young ones i guess also because they have got you see they've got access to the inter internet and the truth is out there <laughs> sound like the is it the x files they used to say that anyway um yeah the thing is the truth is we have access to it. It's just there's so many distractions to stop us looking up and uh, finding the real history. But there's so much, there's there's a lot, there's a lot. If you find, go down the rabbit hole um, or you get, get the red pill somehow, um, it's just peeling an onion. It's never, never ending. And, um, and then you do have access to a lot more than you did um, when... I was at school because because we just had the library and whatever was in the library that's all you had um so unless you went to the British Museum or something but who does that so so yeah you you were limited to whatever was in your local library and uh, I know mine was particularly feminist shall we say I know the people that ran ran it I'm <laughs> looking back <laughs> I'm sure they would be aghast at some of my views now so um so yeah. So anyway, so with Lilith, now the problem is that people have, have really got attached to using Lilith astrologically um, without realising what she really is. Oh God, it's, it's it, I don't really want to talk about this because like I said, this would take a whole podcast, but um, like I said, Lilith isn't in the Bible as um, Adam's first wife. But I know that the archetype is definitely out there, the dark goddess archetype, but I'm not, I don't think Lilith, L Lilith should be, everyone's very stuck with this name because it's got such, it's, it's kind of, well, it's kind of sexy. Everybody likes Lilith because she's kind of sassy and she's, um, there's something kind of quite, I don't know, what's the word? Seductive. Well, it is seductive. I mean, she's a sex succubus. So, um, but she is a demon and no one likes this demon. I mean, this, this person on Facebook, I mean, she wrote a pretty good um, answer, but it was too long. And I just thought, oh God, I know you're just trying to um, see the positive in Lilith, which is I don't think we need to because there are plenty of dark goddesses that are positive and you know the thing with Lilith is the apogee because she said don't all um planets and asteroids have a light and dark and none none are holy light or dark and so Lilith can't be wholly dark but the point is Lilith isn't an asteroid or a planet. She's not. It's just an apogee. It is the state of the moon. The moon is the light of Lilith. The, um, the, the dark moon is the shadow of the moon. That's what it is. So there is no light side to Lilith because it's you can't remove it from the moon. It's connected with the, the moon, the actual moon in the sky, which is to do with the role of the mother. So then the baby killer thing as well, it's like if you call her a baby killer, everyone gets really uptight about, you know, the right to choose. And I don't want to get into a pro-life argument, but at the same time, there's no doubt that the moon is about motherhood. It's about mothers and motherhood. So obviously with Lilith being the, the opposite of that, it's anti-mother. So it goes against that so it's and it's all about sex without the intention of making babies now whether that is evil or not evil i don't know you know some people say call it sterile sex if you're not having babies with it i don't know about that but at the same time that you can definitely have i mean i know that you can have very meaningless sensation loveless sex that is is just you know on on par with masturbation and pornography i mean that that's that's the kind of lilithy 
sex as a drug uh, and also sex as a way to control people as well and then being chained to their desires. So that is Lilith and it's dark. It's like Pluto. I mean, it is like Pluto as well. And is there a good side to Pluto? Yeah, but Pluto is a planet in its own right. Like I said, Lilith only works in tandem with the moon. If there wasn't a moon, there'd be no Lilith. So I put it to anyone that says there must be a positive side to Lilith. The positive side to Lilith is the moon. That's it. But Lilith as the apogee is a demon. It's negative. It's dangerous. And we need to, we need to face that, that dark side and, um, and address it as being dark and not try and sugarcoat it because it's, um, it'll get us into trouble if we do. It's like sugarcoating heroin. <laughs> you know, sometimes you need to know when something is dangerous. Okay. And, uh, and Lilith is, it is dangerous. It absolutely is dangerous and it destroys families. So it's very interesting that the apogee, when the moon is furthest away from the earth, and it, it's funny because I would have thought that the moon, because I know that uh, I've written a whole, I've written a whole article on, there's something very weird about the moon and how it could be, it's being used to control people's emotions. But I do believe you can transcend it as well. And anyway, emotions, the reason that women have got this empathy and this sympathy and this, um, uh, yeah, the empathy side is developed because they need, it was in order to be a good mother because they had to merge with their children to know when they were, hungry or when they're upset because a good mother can sense when the child's in danger and um or needs to be fed and so yeah so the so when Lilith is far away it's like she isn't her sense of empathy is not developed it's um it's distant and yeah and if you and for a baby for survival, if your mother's not there, you die. You die. So, so that's why Lilith is the baby killer because she, when she's the far away moon, when she pulls the moon away, then um, yeah, obviously the the moon isn't as close to her baby as uh, she should be. So yeah, so it kind of makes sense. But I haven't uh, as yet. I have to completely rewrite my book and then then I can explain to people why I'm not being misogynist and I don't, this, I mean, this is the problem as well, is that as soon as you start getting, talking about Lilith as being a evil thing, it's it's taken that you're, you're someone who is very uptight and thinks that uh, any sex that isn't making babies is dirty and uh, forbidden and, you know, no, no, not at all. Um, so, so it's not that. In fact, actually, I read, I remember reading some books by Osho and he was, his, he made a really good point about you can only become celibate and enjoy being celibate and being spiritually, you know, celibate, celib celebrant, <laughs> celibate after having a fulfilling sexual life. But he does say that that is the ultimate goal. So, I mean, when you look at the chakras, it starts from the lower ones and you, and then you rise up to the higher ones and the higher ones. By then, you don't need to be doing the, the animalistic side. Um, but I think it's once you've procreated, once you've had the children, you've got that out of your system and then you're quite content not to be sowing your wild oats. I mean, it's a biological thing, isn't it, really? Um, but once you've achieved that, then I think there's less of the urge to to go around shagging anything that moves, <laughs> really. And, you know, there is a reason why it's, it's celibacy is seen as a kind of honourable thing. It's not as a, as a 
frigid I hate sex I'm scared of it thing at all it's it's not it's more that you aren't driven by those kind of well sort of animalistic side you're just not driven by it anymore and you're channeling it more it is a high chakra experience you know it's all in the in the third eye so I mean I think that's the kundalini awakening it's not being uh, uh yeah well anyway okay i'm go- <laughs> going off at a bit of a tangent here um but anyway yeah I, I i thought it was illuminating what osho said and i mean i know he's he's a bit questionable as well actually um but why is it that most yeah most religions do see rampant sexuality is not a good thing it's it's not a good thing because you're sexually transmitting demons you really are so and if that makes me sound like a complete prude well I don't care because uh you know I've I've reached the wise older age and I know I've been through all of it I've been through all the the Lilith stage And yeah, it's like drugs. It's just short term buzz, but it doesn't really leave you with anything lasting. But moon stuff does, family stuff does, and having children does. So um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. So yeah, thanks for listening. Um, I will film the next one. I just couldn't be bothered today. (laughs) Just wanted to do it the easy way because I wrote three moon posts in a row and um pretty knackered at the end of sunday now so um yeah by the way i was just i have had a bit of a i don't know how to do my moon posts anymore and um i just wanted to figure out a way to do them so that it's not so time consuming and that's the trouble with doing the website and youtube it's like where do i focus do i focus on the website or do i focus on youtube and uh as i said in my new in my moon letters that I put out every two weeks, it seems like I am moving more towards YouTube. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm still figuring, figuring out how to do it in a, in a way that doesn't double the work. So, um, I also thought I want to make them Instagram friendly as well. So I've got some nice kind of square format pictures to put on Instagram as well. So you can follow me on Instagram too, uh, if you like the artwork. Because yeah, the the artist in me comes out all the time. The trouble is sometimes it can, I can get kind of carried away with uh, matching colours <laughs> to go a bit autistic with it. Um, and then I've got to remember I am an astrologer now, not an illustrator anymore. So uh, get back on to the, uh, to the writing. All the recording, all the filming, it's all multimedia. That's Gemini Rising. All right then, all the best, and I'll speak to you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>